Ken Campbell. The Seekers Podcast. Not a holiday, more not a holiday, more not a holiday. Walk about, snell spit, day long, day long, last one, half one, long, everyone, something, bugger up, dead, finish yet, time. Welcome to Ken Campbell, The Seekers Podcast, hosted by me, Daisy Campbell, Ken's daughter, and David Bramwell. Ken Campbell was one of a kind, an unconventional performer, wordsmith, theatre director, comedian, trickster, and creative powerhouse. For this unique series, we'll be plundering Ken's archive to bring you the best recordings of his one-man shows, as well as other selected treats. Okay, Daisy, just give us a brief intro to today's episode. Right, it's called Werner Earhart's Dark Journey, my part in it. Uh, it, it, In this one, Ken attends the legendary EST training, the Earhart seminar training, and discovers what he calls a new form of humour. I'm not here for me to be. I'm here for you and me to be. I'm here to be in the space which you create for me to be, and I'm here to create the space for you and me to be. And I can remember when I heard that said, and it was at the Victoria Palace, May 1971, and it was the May Lectures, they were called. And at the May Lectures, they were wonderful. It was a whole fortnight we had of most extraordinary people. I mean, like the top weirdens. Like, for example, the one I really remember now across all that time is uh, Cleed Baxter. He was terrific. Cleed Baxter, because um, it, it, what he was, Cleed Baxter, was, was actually a, um, a maker, a designer of ever better lie detectors. And what had happened to Cleed was that he'd noticed that in the um, lie detector manufacturing office reception place, they'd, they'd got this uh, new rubber plant. And he thought, hey, I wonder if I'll get a reading from the rubber plant. So he plugged the rubber plant up to a lie detector. And, um, and then he, and he, he could see, you know, he got a little bit of a, th- a re- reaction from it. And he thought, what will happen if I torture it? And he wasn't a smoker, Cleet, so he borrowed a cigarette of um, a secretary and he plunged the lighted cigarette in, 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 in her, into the leaf of the rubber plant. And whoop, he got a, a reading. But then, when he was looking back on it, he noticed he'd got an even bigger reading than the actual moment of the torture at the moment when he'd thought, hey, what'll happen if I torture it? <laughs> and so, to clean thought, yeah, what, what gives with plants? And so he filled all his office up with plant life and plugged it all up to lie detectors. And Cleed Baxter, st- Baxter told us that he was a very, very nervous fl- Liar. Do you know what I mean? He had to fly around the States a lot selling all these um, lie detectors to the different cop authorities and everything. And he, he suffered from the Maltese flux, he called it, which was he always got a rush of shit to the heart whenever an aeroplane um, took off, that moment it took off and the moment that it landed. And he'd keep, because you never know the exact moment, do you, with the exact moment when a, an aeroplane's going to land or take off, and he'd keep an absolute record of when it was. And when he get back, he find that his uh, plants had uh, had all, all responded. They knew that wherever he was in the world, something was up, up with their clean. And he wrote um, a book about all this called The Secret Life of Plants. And it was um, a few of the seekers and I took him out for a drink afterwards, and he told us this incredible story um, about how there'd been a, a particularly gory murder in a greenhouse <laughs> in Chicago. And... Um, so he got the police to round up the, you know, the, the, the usual suspects and then, and then get them to parade through the greenhouse. <laughs> oh, and, I detected. and it was clear who'd done it! <laughs> yeah? And so it was easy, so they just fitted him up with some evidence because, you know, I mean, just, uh, you know they like, um, even, even to this day, they, uh, it's not acceptable in an American court, the, the, the testimony of tomatoes. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not here for me to be. On the last, on the last night of the May lectures, um, we had this guy, and he came out, came out, and that's what he said. He said, I, I'm not here for me to be. I'm here for you and me to be. I'm here to create, the, I'm here to be in the space which you create for me to be, and I'm here to create the space for you and me to be. And his name was uh, 
was Werner Erhardt, and he spoke for an hour. And all he spoke about was um, how, we, how we should approach what it was that he would be saying. And then he spent half an hour thanking us for having done so. And I, man, I thought he was so good. I mean, this was clearly a whole new form of humour. And it, 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 um, it, it turned out he ran human growth, you know what I mean, how to be a more remarkable person courses in the States. And I thought I'd like to go on one of those. Because yeah, no. I'd really like to talk in this new humorous way, but I didn't do anything about it. And then, um, all of a sudden, it was 1975, and I went into a cafe in Camden Town, and there was this girl there, and she was radiating. Um, she was just kind of radiating. I mean, I wouldn't normally, you know, go and sit with a strange anybody, really, except she was radiating. I magnetic radiance was issuing from this woman. And so I, I just found myself sitting at her table, and she said, um, I'm radiating, aren't I? I said, yes. I said, you are. You're ever, ever so radiant. And she um, informed me that I could be every bit as radiant as she if I took the trouble to do what she just done. And the more she carried on that, I suddenly had a notion. And um, so this is what Werner Earhart had done, you see. So I shall cut her bun up. This is what he'd said. He drew, he'd drawn a, he said he drew a better circle. He's better at circles now. I'm not sure. He drew, he'd drawn a circle. This was at the, at the May lectures. He drew a circle, and, uh, and, and he called it a pie. You know, like a pork pie or something. A pie. And then he, he drew on this little... He said, uh, like a little slice in the pie. And he said... This is what we know that we know. And then he'd drawn another slightly bigger slice like that. And this is, he said, it, this is what we know that we don't know. And then referring to all this bit, he just said, and this is what we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> um, and that, he'd assured us, was the area of his expertise. <laughs> So when this girl, the radiant girl, was nattering, I, 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 I cut a slice out of her bun. And I said, just a moment, I said, look, this is what we know that we know. <laughs> and she said, oh, have you done it? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, I haven't done it. I said, but I, I saw that guy, I saw the fellow um, lecturing a, a few years ago at the Victoria Palace, May Lectures. I said, I thought he was very funny. She said, well, he's coming to London. She said, so um, you, you, you must go and be with him. And then she told me the price of um, being with him. And I, I said, I said, God, I, I didn't know there was anything like that. She said, well, you must sell your television. You must sell your car because you have to be there and you know so. <laughs> and um, I said, well, I don't know so at all. But I, I, mean, I seem to have given her my telephone number. And she said, well, I will be passing your number on to Judy Valenchik. And, and then this uh, American voice rang me up. It's a Judy Valenchik. She, uh, she said, I understand you're interested in Earhart Seminars trainings. I, I said, well, I, I, said, I, I saw the guy lecturing um, some years ago. I did think he was very funny. I said, but um, having been alerted to the price of being with him, I said, I don't think, think I'll be coming. She said, can I tell you what we'll do for you? She said, what we'll do is we'll send round um, a graduate of the trainings, very, very skilled in, in looking around your stuff, going through it, and working out what's best to sell. <laughs> I thought, wow, this really is, this really is a new form of humour here. Um, <laughs> I said, no, it's all right. No, I said, no, don't. So I was thinking, what I mean, hell, if it costs that, it costs that, doesn't it? And at least this will be cheaper than having to fly over to the States to do it. I said, I'll, be, I'll find the money from... Uh, anyway, once you've um, sent your money off, they send you um, a brochure. Here we are. What, what is the purpose of the EST training? Can you see EST? It's little E, little S, little T. And it's got a kind of um, reed blowing in the wind over the um, little E of EST. What is the purpose of the EST training? 
The purpose of the S training is to transform your ability to experience living so that the situations you have been trying to change or have been putting up with clear up just in the process of life itself. Werner Erhardt, founder of EST, said, sometimes people get the notion that the purpose of EST is to make you better. It is not. I happen to think that you are perfect exactly the way you are. The problem is that people get stuck acting the way they were instead of being the way they are. Inside, there's all kinds of questions and answers here, you know? Will, will the training interfere with meditation, religion, or any other discipline I am involved with? No. In fact, many graduates who meditate or are involved with other disciplines have told us that their experiences have deepened and been enhanced since the training. Um, will I have to talk in front of the group? Answer only if you want to. There is an opportunity. Do you have to believe the training will work for the training to work? No. It, no, in fact, many people go through most of the training believing it won't work. In the training, you do not replace one kind of belief with another kind of belief. You replace believing with experiencing. Question, why do my friends seem to have such difficulty explaining how the training works? Answer, having someone tell you what it is like to parachute out of an airplane is not the same as experiencing jumping out of an airplane yourself. Est is a uniquely personal experience. Question, what do I need to wear? Answer, you should consider your own comfort and the fact that the training takes place in a hotel. That's <laughs> on, love it. Anyway, it did. It took place in a hotel, um, a, a, a big hotel somewhere near Victoria Station. And uh, what um, I'd now involved myself in was two very long weekends. And on the first Saturday, you had to get there, I think, at half past seven in the morning. This is because you, you had to go through the whole registration process. And, uh, you, and you had to fill in this quite, quite lengthy form. And one of the questions on the form, you, you know, you paid, but you still got to fill in the form. And um, one of the questions was, what do you hope to achieve from Earhart Seminars training? And I wrote down an insight into a new form of humour. <laughs> and um, anyway, I'd done that. I could have be, been um, given a name tag, so it said Ken on it. Earhart Seminars training, Ken. And I was heading off now to the ballroom where apparently it was all going to take place. And then I was stopped. This fella called me back. He said, Oi. I said, I said What? He said, Did you write this? I, I said, Yes. He said, Well, you can't go in. <laughs> I, said, I said, What do you mean I can't go in? I said, I've paid. He said, Well, you can't go in. Not if you wrote this. I, I, and he was pointing this bit where it said, um, um, An insight into a new form of humour. I said, well, it's true. I said, that's why I've come. I said, I saw the guy at the Victoria Palace. He was very funny. That's why I've come. He said, well, you can't go in. <laughs> he, said, um, he said, are you married? I said, no. He said, do you live with anyone? I said, I said no. Um, he said, why did you hesitate when you said no? I said, well, I don't, I don't live with any person. He said, what do you live with? I said, I, li I live with ferrets. <laughs> He said, um, uh, um, are your parents alive? I said, well, my, my dad is, my mum isn't. He said, when did your mum die? I said, I when I was 12, he said, did you complete your relationship with your mother? <laughs> I said, what? He said, did you complete your relationship with your mother? I said, well, I said, well, I said there would have been a bit more to it if she'd have lived on a bit. <laughs> He said, did you complete your relationship with your mother? I said, no. He said, well, you could put that down. <laughs> so I crossed out this insight into a new form of humour and I wrote, I have come to complete my relationship with my mother. And that was fine. And I was now that I could go into the ballroom. And um, there were 500 people, exactly, I would be in the ballroom, and, they, and, and it was not like this, not Hildy Pig. It was, you know, very, very clear. And you, there was kind of a little bit of room in between, in between the chairs, and we'd all got our, our, uh, our name tags. And um, the first event was Namib, a nasty little fella, Namib. 
and um, and Namib was there to um, secure our agreements to the agreements. Actually, nothing would be happening at all until we all, all of us, agreed to the agreements. And um, I remember the, the agreements were like this. The, the, the agreement was no one must, um, be, uh, must have any watch or any other timepiece about their person. And there was a whole palaver. We had to take our watches off and label them and everything, and they were, and they were taken off. We uh, agreed to that. We had to agree that we wouldn't take any notes at all, that we wouldn't record any of the proceedings or have any writing equipment about our persons. That was all, all taken off, and we wouldn't see that at all. Um, the end of the the end of the day, um, we had to um, we had to agree that if we, if we wanted to share, right? If you wanted to share, said Namib, uh, then you you were to raise your hand, uh, and you would just uh, to sit there with your hand raised until you were acknowledged by the trainer. And then you were to remain seated till one of the um, Earhart Seminars Trainings trustee people came with the microphone. Once you'd got the microphone, you were to rise with the microphone and you were to hold the microphone three inches from your mouth. And they had to come round, everybody, all 500 of us, to make sure we all knew what three inches was. And it was a shock for some people. <laughs> And then, having shared, you were to remain standing until the trustee took the microphone from you, and then you were to resume your seat. We agreed to that. We also had to agree that we would only go to the bathroom in designated bathroom. Bathroom breaks. And we said, hang on, just a moment, what, what do you mean by bathroom to me? Um, maybe, maybe more, you mean the lavatory, you mean a toilet, do you? He said, yes. We said, what, what, what do you mean there, what do you mean? So if you were, what, so if you were desperate to, to, to go, then you'd have to just wet yourself, poo your pants, would you, to me, <laughs> sitting there, do you mean? if it wasn't a designated bathroom break. Yes, he said, that is absolutely what you would have to do. And we said, why? And he said, because Werner has found that that is what works. And we said, well, sorry, but he might well work in the United States, but you can't just come over here and spring a thing like that on us. And because some of us may have a weakness or that, you don't know. No one said this. You don't know what we were doing yesterday or anything. That was ridiculous. And he was a nasty piece of work, that me. And we had him now. It was terrific. We were united. And we got the little arsehole on the run, right? And then suddenly there was the wrath of God. And he said, yeah, you fucking assholes. And ain't that why your fucking pathetic lives don't work? Ain't that why you're paying an arm and a leg? I mean, worse it was than that, I'm going to clean it up. <laughs> Gee, and then, there we had in front of us now, the great humorist, Werner Earhart. <laughs> Incredibly, and his um, companion, Ted Long. Werner Earhart, in fact, both good-looking guys, but Werner Earhart had those kind of obscene good looks. Do you know what I mean? What's, I mean, worryingly good looking. I mean, they would bother me, those guys. And, uh, and so I spent the, my first few trying to find some little flaw in his looks. And I, I got it. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it was, uh, oh, it must be seven or eight years ago now. An entirely new form of life was discovered. And it, um, it, it, it was discovered on a hair of the lip of a lobster. Entirely new life form. And it's got three penises, this thing. Tiny little thing. Three penises. Um, and it only knows what to do with two of them. <laughs> it was in the Fortean Times. Like that. Anyway, that was seven or eight years ago. I, I, I spotted one of these things in 1975. 
as Werner Earhart's got one. <laughs> it's really small, though. I mean, like, like, you only see it when he's kind of passing and up close. Oh, there it is, you know. But, I mean, uh, my advice is if you ever encounter the gent, keep your eye, keep your eye on the little three-penis life form there, because it kind of makes him manageable. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the first part of the meeting was, um, is what so, so? Is what so, so? Is what so, so? Is what was so, what was so? Is what will be so, what will be so? Is what so, so? Is this chair, this chair? Is this chair, this chair? Is this chair, this chair? Right? Some guy, some guy. To all intents and purposes. <laughs> It had to all intents and purposes. What does that mean? Do you mean to all intents and purposes? Or is there some kind of get out implied? All intents and purposes. You know, some kind of ticket is that in the back pocket. If the going gets rough, is what so so. Is what so so? Is this chair this chair? Look, well, it's not the advanced class he was explaining. We're not saying, is this chair a chair? We're just saying, is this chair this chair? And look, we hadn't got any watches on. I would say it, uh, it takes four hours, I think, uh, to get 500 people in a ballroom near Victoria all to agree that what is so is so and that this chair is this chair. And then when our heart said, not so obviously, he said, it is also so what? And just along from me, there was this old guy uh, called Jack, and Jack was starting to kind of rumble. And he was going, he's going like that. Mm. And Jan said, said, uh, Jan said, said, I would just like to say... <laughs> and I, and I said, Jack, uh, read his name. I said, Jack, I think we made an agreement that uh, if you want to share, you raise your hand until uh, acknowledged by the trainer. And so uh, <clears throat> Jack raised his hand, but he was not acknowledged. He had his hand up for about oh, half an hour or something. And then he was acknowledged, and he said, I would just like... And they said, hang on, Jack, you made an agreement to wait until the microphone's brought to you. And Jack said, I would just like... They said, hang on, Jack, you made an agreement. You stand, and it's three inches, Jack. Anyway, Jack was fantastic, because he was a man. He'd been in the black ops in the war. Jack was a guy who had tortured people. Jack was a guy who himself had been tortured. And Jack knew what was going on in here. He knew all about the evil ways of fascism. And Werner Earhart said, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, uh, Jack. And um, I said, just a moment, Jack. You made an agreement. You to remain standing until the microphone is taken from you. They said, well, Jack, that was a few things you just wanted to say. What is it you don't want to say, Jack? And Jack said, well, he said, well, I could add this. He said, hang on, Jack, this is just going to be a bit more of your shtick. Said, what is it you don't want to tell us, Jack? He said, what? And they kept him there. They grilled him for ages. You know, you know those men who are like uh, granite? You know, I've always kind of supposed you're not meant to know about them. Well, we found out about Jack. Not only about Jack, we found out about his daughter and about his granddaughter too. And then Werner Earhart said, so, shall we dance with a listening Jack in a conversation for possibility? Listen to that sentence again. Shall we dance with the listening Jack in a conversation for possibility? 
does it mean anything? It means something's a jack, because Jack, he didn't, he didn't um, break down, he kind of, kind of broke up. He went, whoop, whoop, like that Jack went, whoop, whoop. He was going, whoop, whoop. And they came and they took the microphone from him, whoop. And he sat down, whoop. And, and, and a neighbour tried to put, put their arm around Jack and they said, leave him alone. Bring him a bath bag. That's just a bag they carry this organisation in, and so anyone who's broken down here has got something to be sick in, may want to throw up. Bring him a bath bag. Mm. Yeah, Art says, um, uh, would anyone else like to share? <laughs> and um, immediately, yeah, there's this woman. She's got her hand up, ready to share. Share, the microphone goes to her. She doesn't go on long. She doesn't go on long. <laughs> She's moving up. Ooh, ooh. She's going, ooh. And Jack's still at it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> He's going like that. And then the hands are going up. People wanting to share. What are they share? What are they going to do? Some of them only last a few seconds till they've broken up. They've cracked up and they're weeping. Oh, this must be extraordinary. I was looking around thinking, wow, I really wouldn't be anywhere else. <laughs> and, um, the next day, I mean, Jack, J Jack came again. I mean, he, Jack was still there, and he was now Jack. He was some kind of hero, you know? And, and fine-looking women were going up to Jack and, uh, and uh, rubbing him. <laughs> and um, just to, I'm going to cut through now to the, um, the final Sunday. It's sort of like nearly the end of the two long weekends. And it was, did you get it time? Did you get it, have you got it? And they say like this, they say, did you get it, have you got it? So, you know, what's your name, Tom? I say, Tom, Tom. So, they're going to read your name. You say, Tom, did you get it, have you got it? And, 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 um, and the thing is, if you have got it, uh, if you have got it, you, you, and you realise you've got it, you suddenly, boom, it's like a, like you, you watch it, it's, it's like a, a, a light bulb going off in people's heads, boy, oh yeah, yeah, they got it, they got it, and they all kind of let out, oh, yeah, and they got it, and I was in a, uh, in a bit of a, I mean, because I was thinking, got what? I can't have been paying attention at some key moment in all this stuff. Did you get it, have you got it, got what? And then suddenly they were on me, and I, I, I said, what happens when you've got it, and, you know, and everyone seemed to be getting it, that had got it, you know, they've got it. And when, when you've got it, you get to join all the people who've got it, you know, and to radiate over there in that radiating bunch. And they were suddenly, they were on me, I said, did you get it, have you got it? And I said, um, I, I'm, not, I'm, sure, I'm not sure whether I've got it or not. And they said, you're not sure whether you've got it or not, so that's what you've got, so you've got it. I said, what? <laughs> they said, you're not sure whether you've got it, so that is what you got. So you got it. I said, oh, I said, what? Is, is getting it just whatever you get? They said, if that's what you got. And I thought, I can't stand any more of this. I said, oh, I, I don't mean I'm dead. And I was like, oh, I got it, you know. And I went, I went over to join the radiating people. Eh? And I was looking around, we were all radiating. And I thought, are we all faking it or just me? You really couldn't tell. And it, and it was thinking that, that kind of made me go and radiate for real. And I, I had got it. And uh, we all got it. Now, once, once, uh, once the magic's been performed and everyone's got it, um, in a short while, what's going to happen? We don't, you don't know this. You don't know this, but about a thousand people have, 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 have already got it some other place. Heard in and love you and rub you. <laughs> but you don't know that yet. Anyway, um, Werner Rauer and Ted Long were saying, you know, it's worse, it's nearly over now. He says, now is a chance for anyone who didn't get to share, to share. And I hadn't got to share. Uh, and uh, so I put my, put my hand up and I knew exactly what to do and I waited till I got the microphone. And I, I, said, I said, I saw Werner performing at the Victoria Palace a few years ago and I, I thought he was very funny. <laughs> and I said, I said, I suppose in a sense I've been no less entertained here over these two long weekends. I said, I, I haven't shared. I said, because... I said, it seems that my life 
it just seems is, is, is really quite different from certainly everyone that we've heard from. I work, I, I live alone, I work um, for myself. I said, I say I live alone and that isn't, isn't actually quite true. I said, but there is just me and the ferrets. <laughs> and this was absolutely so, because back then I, I was touring around with a hit act that myself and a little group had, which was some, the putting of live ferrets down your trousers for world record lengths of time. It was a big hit in the working men's clubs of the North. Um, we also played Amsterdam without Germany, and also Jerusalem. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, and so I said, there's a, 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 he didn't seem to know what a ferret was. And I said, well, it, these sort of, I said, very vicious little animals, you know, that are used for um, hunting. Um, I said, well, what I, what I want to share with you um, is, is what happened last night. I said, um, what, 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 what I, I was about to refer to, um, was um, an exercise that we did a lot over those two weekends. Um, this is um, an, I don't know what if it's an exercise in um, communication, I think, or something. Anyway, what you have to do is you have a partner. It's a different partner every time you have to do it. And what you have to do is you just sit like quite close, and they'd be about there. You see, sit quite close, and with both your eyes, you look into one eye of that other person, and they with both their two eyes, they'll be looking into one of your eyes, right? And, it, and, and, and they don't do anything except in your mind you're saying it's quite okay for you to be there, it's quite okay for me to be here, it's quite okay for you to be there, it's quite okay for me to be here, it's quite okay for you to be there, it's quite okay for me to be here, it's quite, I mean, you go, I don't know how long it would have been, I mean, I have thought half hour at least you would do this for, quite okay for you to be there, quite okay for me to be here, quite okay for you to be there, quite okay for me to be here, and then would come the command, change eyes, wow, quite okay for you to be there, quite okay for me to be here. Wait, I mean, here. I said, I said, the thing about, you know, living with ferrets is, I said, you can't designate the bathroom break of a ferret. <laughs> yeah, I said, you know, they're, you know, they're just going to, when they fancy it, go. But I said, you get to know, the, you know, the, 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 the places they're likely to be going and you can put newspaper down. And um, I said, well, I got in uh, late, late, you know, early hours of the morning after the session the previous night. I, um, I said, you know, the, the ferrets. I said, and then one of the ferrets was backing up to have a shit. It's quite a, quite a performance when they have a shit, ferrets, because they, you know, so long, it's kind of like backing up a lorry and trailer. You know, something like that. Backed it up, and then when, once they backed it up, they're, 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 they arch their backs, and their head looks up like that. <laughs> Well, they're almost blind ferrets, actually, and they kind of look up. It looks like they're looking at you. And I mean, and, and I've just found myself. I was sharing all this. I, said, I just found myself <coughs> looking into the one eye of my ferret, and I'm going, "It's quite okay for you to be there. It's quite okay for me to be here." I said, <coughs> and what was extraordinary was that the ferret had finished its business and it carried on doing the exercise with me for quite some time. <laughs> And um, <laughs> um, Werner Earhart said, well, thank you for sharing that with us, Kim. <laughs> and then he said, um, anything else? I thought, all right, yeah, OK. I said, I, I would, I said I'd like to share that I think this est is terrific, I said. Um, and I said, but I, I, I don't want to get further involved in it, if that's OK. I said, I don't, want, I don't want to have to be running around with microphones like this, or doing anything like that. And I said, but I wouldn't half mind having an outfit like this myself. I said, but I said, I think mine um, um, would, would be different. I'd, I'd, go, I'd go about it kind of from another end. And I said, I think, and I was sort of fishing him because uh, I said, I think I, I said, I think I would call mine jest. And I'd stayed up all night doing this thing, you see, uh, jest. Can you see the J of my jest 
It's made, you would see this in the front there, it's made look by, the, by a tumbling ferret, that joke. <laughs> Uh, so I read, I read to them from my brochure, jest. What is the purpose of the jest training? The purpose of the jest training is to transform your ability to sense the ludicrous in everything. So that every situation you find yourself in is seen to be the jape of the century. Ken Campbell, founder of Jest, said, Sometimes people get the notion that the purpose of jest is to make you a comedian. It's not. I happen to think that you are hysterically funny the way you are. <laughs> The problem is that people get stuck seeing how tragic they were instead of how comic they are. <coughs> In the middle were some questions and answers. <laughs> Question, how much does it cost? Answer, no money. In fact, not even the price of the postage for registering for it if you address the enclosed envelope to Father Christmas and write in a very childish hand. <laughs> Question, will I be made to look ridiculous? Answer, no. You will discover how ridiculous you already look. <laughs> Question, will I need Wellingtons? <laughs> Answer, yes. <laughs> Question, will my organs have to be in shape? I said, well, it'll have to be in some shape, obviously. <laughs> but seriously, everyone's organs are uniquely shaped and uniquely funny. <laughs> Question, will I be permitted to smoke? Answer, only during short specified periods of the booger event <laughs> when smoking is compulsory. <laughs> um, Question, will the trainer wear smart casuals? Answer, yes. Anyway, and then it's uh, details. There we are. To take place. Uh, 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 and uh, Werner our heart said, well, thank you, Karen. Thank you for, for sharing your, your jest with us. But no one had come for the microphone. Which is a worry, because I'd certainly run out of material now. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, Werner Earhart said, Ken, he said, did you write the letter? Now, what he was referring to was a bit of homework that we were supposed to do. This was where you write a letter to a loved departed one, i.e. someone that you loved who's dead. You write a letter, you don't have to send it, it's just kind of, shush in there! It's just a kind of... Uh, <laughs> It's just a kind of um, uh, an exercise in completing your relationship with dead people. Um, he said, did you write the letter? I said, yes. He said, who did you write your letter to, Ken? I said, I wrote my letter to a dog I had when I was a child. This is a dog, a mongrel dog called Tim, uh, who ran away one time and got run over. I said, I told Tim that I now took responsibility for his having run away and getting run over. And Werner Earhart said, anything else? I said, yes, and some notes to some mice. <laughs> he said, he said, um, he said, um, may I see the letter, Ken? <laughs> and I said, um, well, no, I, 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 um, the thing was, I hadn't, I, the thing was, I hadn't written that at all. I mean, what I'd written, I'd written a letter to my mum. And I said, um, well, I said, no. I said, I'm afraid you, you can't um, see it. Uh, because in the last all too brief bathroom break, I said the cubicle I was in didn't have any paper. <laughs> <laughs> and Werner Earhart, 
was looking with his two tummy, two eyes. He was looking with his two eyes into the weaker of my eyes. <laughs> like that. I, I had my two eyes focused on that tiny little three penis. <laughs> No, I form. I don't. It's like a stand <laughs> He said, thank you for sharing that with us, Ken. And I got away with it! <laughs> Fantastic! And then they opened the doors and everyone erased in and they, and they loved us and rubbed us and people were saying, is this so? Is this so that you really are going to be running your, your jest uh, workshop? And I said, yes, it is absolutely so. And um, people said they were coming. And Jack, old Jack, he said he'd be coming. And everything you know, to my jest humour workshop. And um, people did, did write, and, and about 20, on the, on the designated day, um, about 20 people did show up. Jack didn't show up. But I, but I tell you, who did? Did, I mean, I, was this enormous? I'm not sizist at all, but I mean, it's, she was enormous, you know, in that, in that, in that, cause it, you know, in that kind of American way. She wasn't American, but you know, that way that you'd thought that only they can do, you know, kind of room. I saw a roaring pear shaped lady. She was an underhead mistress or something. And, 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 like, and, and, and unlike other plump people that I'd, she was not jolly at all. I mean, it really hadn't occurred to me that somebody was really in need of my training was going to show up. I thought it was all going to be jokey people. But she was there, you know, and I was, I was trying to explain, you know, to the class, like, keep things going, the difference between um, a snicker, a snigger, a smicker, and a snork, and, uh, and things like that, and getting them to do it, and, try, you know, like to try, oh, blimey. But this woman was killing it, you know, just her presence was killing it. It was like with her enormous arse, she was going to sitting on us all. And I thought, I mean, I, uh, desperate measures now. What I'll have to do is I'll have to bring forward the booger event. I mean, I kind of thought in my mind I'd use it as the climax, but I thought, well, I'd better bring it forward now. And the booger event is something that I'd always I'd, I'd known about. I'd known about it ever since I got this book, which was ages ago. It's a book called Technicians of the Sacred. And, you know, like primitive people who haven't had the wit to invent, you know, theatre where people come in and out of doors and pretend to be other people. But, but they nonetheless, you know, they, the primitive people, they, they get on, you know, they do have kind of shows, but just, they're not plays, they haven't invented that yet. And, um, and this is a book of them, you know. And actually, I mean, as a matter of fact, a lot of them are way, way superior ideas to plays, you know. Like the, um, the going round Greece event of the Greenland Eskimos, for example. Um, but my particular favourite is the booger event of the Cherokee Red Indians. So I, here's how it goes, and this is what we want to be doing. Booger event. Participants. A company of four to ten uh, boogers. Um, each, each booger is given a personal name, usually obscene. For example... Black man, black ass, Frenchy, big balls, arsehole, rusty arsehole, burst a penis, swollen pussy, long prick, sweet prick, piercer, fat ass, long haired pussy, etc. Do you see what I mean? So you're not stuck with that list. You can invent other ones if you wish. That's fine. Prelude. The boogers enter, the audience and the boogers break wind. First action, the uh, boogers are systematically malignant, etc. They act mad, full on the front, blah, blah. Anyway, it's going to move us on to the third action now, which was to be the hit of the morning. Third action. The booger dance song. The name given to the booger should be taken as the first word of the song. This is repeated any number of times while the owner of the name dances a solo performing as awkward and grotesque steps as he or she possibly can. The audience applauds each mention of the name, while the others indulge in exhibitionism, e.g. thrusting their buttocks out, and occasionally displaying towards the women large phalli concealed under their clothing. These phalli may contain liquid, which is then released as a spray. If you want to try this, it, um, <laughs> you could just, I mean, you don't have to spend a load of money. You can just have little squeezy things, you know, like under there, uh, uh, there for the, f for the phalli. Uh, what, I, what I did then was I got, I got the group um, in a circle and um, I said, what we'll do is we'll let our, our booger names grow out of us organically. So, like, 
the way it would go, so it would take a name like Big Bulls, yeah? So what you do is you've got everyone in this circle and you start the chant going down. Big bulls, big bulls, and everyone's kind of looking around. Big bulls, big bulls, big, kind of inquiringly. Big bulls, big bulls, big bulls, big bulls, big bulls, big bulls. Keep going, it doesn't matter, we've got all day. He knows who he is. Big bulls, big bulls, big, and eventually there he is, wow. And it's kind of stunning, it's like, like a booger spirit of big balldom goes boom and takes him over. Big bulls, big, and then you keep it going, and, he has, and he's dancing, the, you know, the booger dance of big bollocks and and then and then it's back and then you move on and well anyway when we got down to fat ass <laughs> there wasn't a look at look a bit of looking around needed and it was like there she was and it was like she assumed really you know that, that, that being sport enough you know to acknowledge well obviously that was her, that would be enough for us but it wasn't by this time at all fat ass fat people were getting really inventive fat Fat, it's like demanding. She's got to go for it now. Fat, ass, fat. and he faced it back. Ass, fat. And then suddenly she was there. Right, the booger spirit of fat ass entered her, entered her fat ass, boing, and she started slinging a thing around, like that, all with a whoop, right, 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 like that. Fat ass, fat ass, and we kept going. I mean, she really was overweight. We thought she's going to be having a coronary soon, but you had to keep going. You just got to fat ass, fat ass, fat. I mean, it was crazy. Like, oh God, what's the court case going to be like here? <laughs> Fat ass, fat ass, fat ass. She was possessed. She could, she could fat ass around now, you know, longer than we could be bothered going fat ass. And then we decided to uh, have an early, early lunch. But she was the, uh, she was the darling of the do. Fat ass. Oh, we loved her and we rubbed her, and 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 and, and she uh, rubbed us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ken Campbell, The Seekers Podcast, was produced and presented by Daisy Campbell and David Bramwell, with kind permission from the Ken Campbell Estate. Music was by Horton Jupiter. It was funded by Arts Council England.